Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, a host of the Dare to Dream radio and podcast show for over 15 years. This show won the Coalition of Visionary Resources Best Radio Show and Podcast Award. It's been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award and is currently listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top best radio shows to listen to out of 20. So we're very honored. I'm very honored for all of those acknowledgements and for all of you who are here listening, following and enjoying this journey. And thanks for your comments, by the way, on YouTube and otherwise it really means a lot. A little bit later, I'm gonna be bringing on Serena Wright Taylor. She's an intuitive Vedic astrologer, a UFO researcher and humanitarian. And the show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. So if you would like to become a facilitator or have your bars run or go to a class, etc., you can do so anywhere in the world. Go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I am Debbie Dashinger and I do media visibility out into the world. And besides this 15 year award winning show, I also am a book writing coach. I help people to write a very highly engaging book and put it out in the world from idea and inception to published. I also have a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status, and I do all the heavy lifting for you. And the third leg of my visibility hub is the ultimate visibility formula, how you can get booked on radio and podcast shows and get massive results. I also have a free gift for you in the visibility arena. So if you would like to learn how to make your being in your business way more prevalent out into the world, way more known and have your tribe find you so it's easy, please accept my free gift. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift and download yours today. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. Well, today's episode is a conversation on UFOs and intuitive Vedic astrology. My guest, Serena Wright Taylor, is an award winning conference producer, intuitive Vedic astrologer, UFO researcher, writer, creative artist, and humanitarian. Serena is an ambassador for the Love Button Global Movement, which fosters acts of kindness all over the world. An intuitive Vedic astrologer for more than 35 years, Serena combines her psychic ability and astrology to assist clients worldwide. And if you would like to learn more about her, go to vimana.org. It's V-I-M-A-N-A dot org. And with that, I welcome the very beautiful Serena to the Dare to Dream show. It's great to have you here. Hello, Debbie. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It is my pleasure. And I want to just start, I gave an overview of what you do, but will you explain what is the work you do? What are the services that you provide out into the world? <laughs> oh, well, so many things. <laughs> and sometimes I thought, you know, that saying, Jack of all trades, master of none. Sometimes I think that's me. But <laughs> I, I think that when we are interested in something, we naturally do it kind of all the time. So if you can actually do that as your work, that's great. And um, and I've always been interested in Vedic astrology and I've studied that for years and years. And um, and I originally um, was very psychic. Well, I still am, but I was just doing psychic reading, so to speak. Ah. And, um, and I would do, and, and I used to live in ashrams and I would do psychic readings uh, with tarot first. Um, for my god sisters in ashrams and then um and then of course there was vedic astrologers around because this is with vedic teachings and i would start learning from them and it seems that my whole life there's always been somebody who would take me under their wing as teacher and help me to to do readings and then now i you know i still always learn i still feel i always learn and um and i discuss things with other vedic astrologers as well um, so that's one of the things I do. And um, then I also am a, one of the producers of the Conscious Life Expo. And in that, I bring the UFO speakers, most of those speakers, and also the ancient secrets, uh, you know, those from Ancient Alien Show and also others. 
um, who are studying the ancient teachings and ancient mysteries on the planet. So that as well. And, um, and many things at the expo, some of the entertainment and the food and, you know, we're just a team and we all meet together and we have input, you know, and it's really great. And I was doing that before I really was considered one of the producers. I would just suggest people and just do it like, again, automatically, you know, it's part of your life. Um, and then, um, so some of the other things, so I've studied spiritual life all, all my life, trying to make progress spiritually. And particularly, um, you're mentioning Love Button Global Movement. Um, it's a wonderful movement about giving, you know, doing little things for people. Mm. And actually, I was thinking today, you know, because even it could be a, a smile. Ah. I think it's someone to help them feel better smile and it will change their whole energy, you know. And, um, and then just doing a favor. So it's all about things like that. And we give out love buttons as well. Um, but um, I was thinking about something that happened to me a long time ago now in my 30s when I was, it was a really, I had really bad 30s. That was not, those were not good years. And I remember once being um, at a, at a um, mall and I was just um, walking in one direction and there was a girl walking towards me and there was something special about her. She looked very normal, but it's, I just... There's an energy field, and she smiled at me. She had like an angel to cheer me up, but it totally changed my energy. Even though at that time I was not very happy, and uh, and it totally made me think, is this an angel come to help? But yeah, we can all be angels for other people. So that's another thing, you know, that I really like to try to practice. Um, but those are some of the things. Was there anything else you were thinking about? <laughs> Serena, I understand that you received guidance in your dreams from a really young age, and you were just mentioning that you had been psychic. So yeah. what, uh, what was that like for you? What kind of dreams are we talking about? Uh, yeah, I love your show. It's called Better Dream. And I was thinking about that. I think, yeah, a lot of my life is kind of um, things happened in dreams before they happen in real life. I think that's a lot of people have that. Um, but um, when I was little, I, I used to have experiences first seeing the universe. And and because I, I used to spend a lot of time in looking in ponds, in our pond, in the garden and studying insects. And I really loved doing that. And, um, you know, putting them in jars and learning about them. And, uh, and also, you know, the pond had so much life in it. So many different kinds of creatures live in there that are so tiny. And um, and so at night, I would often have dreams, but they appeared like dreams, but, you know, they weren't really, I think they were lessons, they were classes, and I would learn about the universe. So I would see all kinds of planets, very much like my husband, Douglas Taylor's pictures, like, like the one up here, I think you can see, um, people are used to those, um, where there's a lot of planets in the sky. And I actually saw craft, I called them buses then, because I didn't know about UFOs or anything buses going from one planet to another and um, on a, like a little on like a little roadway like a little dotted line almost and um, all these and sometimes they were a little scary but other times they weren't and um, and it was as if my ceiling disappeared and became the universe and, and I didn't feel I could fall into it but it's almost like you could you know it's like there like the water so I began thinking you know the universe is life just like my pond there's little things there's bigger things <laughs> this things could go in the pond and out in the air. So it was kind of like that. Amazing. And and I I realized earlier and on that the universe is full of life. That was my first kind of and then they <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Oh please sorry. I thought you were done. Okay. Please go ahead. Oh no you're, you're no, freezing a little they, bit so it's oh hard. okay I'm sorry. Um and then they um um started being like a school. So once I started going to school some of my dreams started being with a, a desk and, and there was teachers there and I still get those dreams now. And there's teachers that I never see their face. I know they have um, robes on and I know they're way taller than me. And I might have seen their face, but never remember it. So I don't know. Um, and I don't even know if you could say that was a UFO or that's my spirit guides. At first I was sort of, you know, it's a spirit guides teaching us. And we would, you know, we learn all kinds of things and I don't remember them all. Um, I do remember some where 
um, a really major big one where I learned about um, how they were showing like a hologram of blood in the body and all the little cells. And they were saying, when you eat some raw vegetables, raw foods, that every day your blood improves and, and you could see the actual uh, blood cells get larger and rounder and not be an odd shape. They were odd kind of shape. And, and, and so they were teaching us, um, you know, to like I started having juice. So like about four days a week, I make, you know, vegetable juice in the big juicer. And I, I think that's what they were kind of teaching me. Um, but what I noticed in these classes, um, and I'm sure other people have these because I've met people who've had classes like this, you, you like I could look around, it's almost like I could see it in the back of my head, but I could look around in the room and know that everyone's different, but I just love all of them and they love me and, and everything's full of love. It's so amazing to describe mm -hmm. because I'm not judgmental, just like that one about food. Everyone would be eating differently. I knew that, but at the same time, I wasn't judging. It's a very hard thing to explain, um, but it was. But those kinds of dreams are so amazing. And when you wake up after having that, you just feel so transcended and positive, you know. Um, so I try to kind of keep like that. Um, and I know my husband had his own, and he's been on your show, and he's described similar things. But um, yeah, and I repeated, there was a lot more to that dream that I repeated to him when I woke up because that was more recent, um, not when I was a child, that was more into in the 90s, was it? No, sorry, early 2000s. Um, but, um, but yeah, I had dreams like that where I'm at school and I learned things and their spiritual things are the things about healing um, or just wisdom. And, um, and I hope sometimes I don't remember, but it goes in there and comes out maybe when I'm giving a reading or something, hopefully. Wow, that's so interesting <laughs> on two levels. The first, when you're saying that, I mean, I love that you widen it up. It could be spirit guides, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My brain initially went to, this is past or concurrent parallel lives of you on another planet and your tribe is showing up. Uh, still connecting <laughs> yeah. with you while you're here. It, it could be that too. Yeah, it's a it would be so great if it could be a lucid <laughs> dream and you could, you know, ask at some point, right. who are you? What are you? What are we? I did ask, I remember asking a question once um, and well, it wasn't really a question because I was thinking it to myself, but the, the guide or the teacher can hear you in your thoughts. So, because they're speaking in your thoughts and, and I wanted, we were working on some healing uh, and we're bringing our energy through it's almost like through our eyes just like our third eye and aiming at that person to heal them we were in a circle and i thought well when i go back i'm going to do this and um and i didn't it wasn't really a question but they the guy that very strongly in my head said or the teacher you know you can do this if you know the secret and the secret is to do it without ego so if you know we, so when we come back we try to do these good things to people, try not to have an ego about it, and it'll be more powerful, it'll work. <laughs> that's what they were saying. Yeah, uh, that's so beautiful. I, I know I saw you at Disclosure Fest, we are both waiting for food, right? By the oh, truck. yes, yes, we were. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> you saying to me, so I'm thinking about the vegetables, the raw vegetables and the juicing and all that. And I'm thinking about how you would turn to me because I think almost all the food there was exclusively vegan, maybe vegetarian, but certainly vegan. And I remember you saying you were so happy about that. So uh -huh. that dream, did that lead to you becoming a vegetarian or vegan? Um, no, not that one, um, because that one was more recent. I became vegetarian when I was 14. That would be 1967. And um, I was already studying, I'd had a lot of dreams, not necessarily about food though. <laughs> Although I think about it a lot. <laughs> but but um, the um, uh, dreams I was having, like I described to you about the universe and everything. Um, I wanted, you know, I was following Buddhism at the time. Um, I tried different kinds of teachings. I was just getting, I joined the library. Of course, there was no internet or anything then. Um, and I would get, books not out of the teenage or children's section I'd get them out you know the grown-up section about philosophies and Buddhism and stuff so um I thought oh yeah I want to be a Buddhist and, and I'm not going to eat meat 
And so, um, and I already wanted to do that from earlier because, you know, I had pets and everything. I didn't, couldn't, I could see there's not really their animals as well. No one eat them, they all have feelings. Um, so my mother had to cook separately for me or, you know, I ate the vegetables and, um, and the doctor, she brought me to the doctor and, and the doctor said, oh, um, uh, well, lions and tigers eat me. But then I said, but I'm not a lion or a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that she could say but yeah that's when I became vegetarian then um, and it was great to see so many um you know vegetarian and vegan um uh trucks there at disclosure fest <laughs> that was really good yes it's more and more prevalent for sure mm -hmm. and I want to make sure to hearken back to something you said in the very beginning because there was just some uh, video interruption and you were telling a story your 30s were a very difficult time for you and you were in a mall and there was a girl very special walking towards you will you finish that oh yeah she smiled at me so you know i was really feeling very upset and down and um and i looked up and there was a girl and i wish she had brown hair and a jacket i remember um some, her bag on her shoulder and she smiled at me even though i didn't know her um because you know i would think well i don't know that person why she's fine and um but then uh, i felt so like as if she'd uplifted my whole energy field and I didn't even know how to describe it that way at the time and uh, when she went past me I did turn my head thinking again do I know her what is this and I, I didn't see her so she should have she could have gone around the corner or she could have been an angel sent there to smile at me just to give me energy you know um, so you know we can be like that for other people that's kind of what I was saying you never know what people are going through and sometimes just a smile can help and then they'll feel positive and then they'll smile at someone else. Or you can do favors or say compliments, just a little things like that make a huge difference. That is very true. <clears throat> I've had that happen and I've often, sorry, I'm having a little cough here. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I've mm -hmm. often uh, positioned myself to do that. If I'm in an elevator and I see something or yeah, I make it a point. It's always interesting too, if you really smile at someone and they stare right at you and look away, it's like, hmm, it's a missed opportunity. So yeah, I, I love that because it's simple and it's a contribution. Yes, yes. And sometimes even, you know, I feel a little embarrassed to help people. I remember I was helping someone carry something up some steps and, you know, I was like hesitant to say anything. Sometimes you feel I don't know, a bit shy. I feel a bit shy sometimes, but I make myself do it because I know that really, you know, everyone's the same. We're, we're that we could be them. They could be us, you know. So let's switch to Vedic astrology. I really want to do a deep dive here. I know that's your wheelhouse. <clears throat> <laughs> and I'm very open. And I'm sure folks would like to know first, are there astrological global patterns that are affecting all of us right now and if so what are they yes they they always are actually affecting us right now and we've actually got past um, a really tough thing well obviously everyone can see that um but you know we had the the virus and and all that and we also had um the in the in 2020 um at the end of 2020 um Jupiter was at its most debilitated position, and this is in Vedic astrology. Um, Jupiter is, of course, you know, the most spiritual planet, um, the most the planet of knowledge and wisdom and goodness, all good things, and it was in its lowest position. And then Saturn came and went and sat on it as well. So we had the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter together, with Jupiter at its weakest possible point. And what many Vedic astrologers called it was the um, lack of dharma, the loss of dharma, which is spiritual practice and knowledge and, and so on. So, um, so that was really a typical time in it. And that was the 21st of December 2020. But the thing is, it was, um, you know, that was the middle of it. It's like it was building up the whole time and, and Jupiter was debilitated already for the year, you know, but I'm just saying that was really, you know, extreme. And we're coming out of that now. And now Jupiter is very positive. It's in its own sign of Pisces. And if people know anyone who knows their Vedic chart, 
um, you know, there's a difference by 23 degrees. So I'm saying, you know, uh, certain planets are in certain houses. They may be a little bit different in tropical. Um, I know Jupiter's in Pisces in both, but um, like for instance, Saturn for us, in, and this is in the sky. Vedic astrology is the same as astronomy. It's the same as if you were looking in the sky, you would see that actually Saturn's gone a little bit back into Capricorn and it's, it was in Aquarius for a short time. It's gone back. It's going to go back to 21, oh, sorry, 24 degrees. And then it's going to go forward again. It's about 26 now. It's retrograding. Um, so um, then it's going to go back into Aquarius for January next year. Um, now there's a difference. You probably think, oh, what's all this about? <laughs> well, Capricorn is restriction. Capricorn is like, you know, certain rules and having to follow certain rules and, and it is structure and all that and building structure, but it's overwhelming. And I, I really think that a lot of us really think that the whole time Saturn was in Capricorn, it was really what it was all about the virus. Something was giving us incredible restrictions. And so it went back in a bit. So some things have become a bit strict again. And they're kind of other things. They might not necessarily, there might be laws and stuff, right? That's been happening lately. So there's a bit more toughness there. Then in January, it moves to Aquarius. And so that's obviously, you think air, freedom, movement, you know. Um, it's, it's So they both belong to Saturn, but Aquarius is much more progressive and moving forward and inventive. And um, all those, you know, more of like what we think of Saturn as a progress in certain ways. But what's really good is um, Jupiter is in Pisces. So if you know your Vedic chart, if anyone knows that, and you know you've got planets in Pisces, it's your Jupiter is going to be with, with those planets for you and be helping. So if you look at your Vedic chart and see where Pisces is, you know that Jupiter is blessing that all year. And, um, and it, even though it's retrograde, it's probably going back to something else to help you. So. Um, that's very good. And um, so uh, it's good to know your Vedic chart because then, uh, and then, you know, when you have readings and so forth, you can know, well, this, what's happening and why and how it, I, but the thing is with astrology, um, I was saying earlier to you, you know, um, we can't just rely on, oh, what's happening in the chart, in, the, in astrology, in the sky, how, when's the world going to get better? We have to think about ourselves getting better and making that effort because that what that's what makes the difference the consciousness us you know um, working on our own personal consciousness and and as um, probably um, everyone who listens to you a lot of a lot of people listening to you might know about um, might believe in reincarnation and how you know our consciousness is what builds our next body you know we improve in our bodies and maybe even in which planets we're on and better planets, <laughs> and we can progress and progress um, according to our consciousness. So, and no matter what the uh, astrology is saying, if we keep working on ourselves, then when even when we have a bad transit, um, we can deal with it a lot easier than than if we're not, you know, we're just being pushed around by karma. Hope I've had both sense. readings, regular astrology, mm -hmm. Vedic. I have to say, the Vedic astrology was probably one of the most powerful. Mm, readings I've ever yeah. had. Can you just explain? You said Vedic is based on astronomy. So then, what is regular mm -hmm. astrology based on, and how do they differ? Well, they're both uh, yeah, both astronomy, but um, but it's it's now there's twenty three degrees difference because of the precession of the equinoxes. It's about 23, 24, 23 and a half. Um, so uh, so tropical, and they both work. They both work. So it's not that you know I would say. That everything's wrong with tropical it's not it's just that i find it better to to do vedic but they both work and and there's an explanation for everything that i just said in tropical as well it's amazing and there's other kinds of astrology in the world you know all different kinds and they all work very well so if someone comes to you for a reading what is that like um oh well i usually i do them on the phone and um uh so I get, I just need the um, birthday and the place and the time of birth. Some people don't know the time and I can do it, but you don't get so much information as when you actually know the time you were born. There's so much we can see that way. And so then I work on the chart and, and we make a date to 
have the reading, a time, and, that, and they call me. And it's an hour long. Um, after that, you can have half hours if you want, but the first one's always an hour because there's so much to go into. So usually I have a lot to tell a person at the beginning um, because I've studied it. And often on, so on the, on the astrology part of it, I'm writing notes, but then on the psychic part of it, I might be given a theme, like I might be studying something and I'll know, oh, this is because of this and they're going to have that happen. And so, and there's a theme, you know, and I've got to encourage them to do a certain kind of healing or whatever it might be. So it's going coming in in two ways. When I'm working on their chart, it doesn't mean only when I have them on the phone, but I've, so I'll have loads of things to say. And I um, do that first. And then we, do, we get into the questions because I always think that's why the person's called. They probably have one particular question or a whole bunch of particular questions. So I really want to cover those. And sometimes they find I have covered them in the first part, you know, when I'm doing that first uh, half hour. But if not, we'll work on that. And um, and sometimes it's if it's about locations, I also do astrocartography, Excellent. which um, helps to show because when when you're born, of course, the sun was rising somewhere and setting somewhere, and Venus was was rising, or Mars was on the mid heaven. So that all the planets were in certain positions in the sky over different places in the world, and that's how we know is that a good place for you or not, you know, um, mm. and it's you but i always think you know don't just choose a place only because astrocartography is good there if you love the place if you want to go if you're trying to move somewhere we'll see what it's like for you or maybe you should be just a little bit to the north or just a little bit to the west but um it don't just go for only that reason how detailed can you get in that so for instance if i need to move within Southern California, Los Angeles, can you get it down to the cities that would be best for me or anybody else? It, it depends because some places have no lines. And so don't worry about it. We, you know, we just don't want a negative line. So, because it's huge, you know, I mean, a spot amount of space. So if you've, there's three different lines I use, there's the, um, the main different mid heavens and rising and so on, like I was saying, then there's the local space lines, which come out from your birthplace. And then there's the parent lines, which run across. And, um, and the main ones are the most important, the first ones I mentioned. So um, you might have a line there, or you might not. Um, you might have a more difficult line in one city and, and not in the other city. You know, so we can look at it that way. And sometimes, mostly, if it's like, say it's, uh, let's say it's Southern California, you might just have one at the same kind of energy in the whole part of it. <laughs> you know, it's really, it depends, you know, um, but sometimes it's one city can be better than the other. And, uh, but, you know, it, it, you don't know until you do it. Okay. <laughs> what are people going through right now? What are they going through? What's <laughs> happening with astrology that's impacting us? What can we look well, for? Well, that's kind to? of, yeah, what I was saying earlier, um, I was kind of saying that earlier, um, uh, you know, it's always important to make progress in some way or other. I think um, now that we've come out of that kind of ignorant time astrologically, we can start, you know, working on our own, you know, improvement of, of our life and our progress, you know. But um, uh, I think people have gone through a lot. And the thing is, um, we have to think, why am I here at this time? You know, uh, there's a reason why we're all here now. You know, to make a difference, perhaps, you know, and to learn certain lessons. But there's certainly a reason. Um, and I think that we have to know that, not just feel like to be victims, but to know what, why am I here and what can I do to help? But everyone's going through different things according to their chart. So when you said, what are we all going through? We're all going through different things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's showing in different ways. Interesting. I, I just know sometimes when I get reports on astrology, sometimes it'll say it's going to be very difficult for relationships. There'll be a lot of stress or, mm -hmm. you know, different factions of life and categories right. seem to be impacted. Well, yeah, there's those things. Yes. And so let me see. So uh, Venus just went into Leo Vedic. So it just went into Leo. Um, uh, so that's good for, yeah, that's particularly good for Leos. I think that um, really, um, when I, when I look at sometimes there are certain themes, like I said, it's very, it's more spiritual and uplifting because of where Jupiter is. So I kind of said that earlier, 
Um, and uh, yeah, sometimes very powerful things will happen or there'll be certain conjunctions and things. And I often put that out on a little um, update that I put out, but I don't do it monthly. And I'm sorry about that. I keep People keep asking, can you do it for a month? <laughs> because the thing is that I might be really busy and not have time to do it. But, um, but yeah, I, like, I do try to um, do a little um, update for my clients that talks about, you know, if there's a particular conjunction coming or a particular retrograde or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you mentioned earlier, Serena, that your husband, Doug Taylor, mm -hmm. has been on the show. That is correct. And he shared some of his really extraordinary stories of being on spacecraft, very positive stories, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. And talk more about your enjoyment or pull to the ufo arena because i know that you have investigated ufo sightings mm -hmm. so let's start there let's start yes puerto rico crop circles tell us about that yes um uh, i love that I, uh, well nowadays there's not so many prop crop circles in um, in general and um, most of them were in england but they are in other parts of the world um and there was a time back in the 90s mostly early 2000s to 88 we're really kind of it started in 1988 i would say for a lot of us and then um through through the 90s um and early 2000s so there was um a, a, a lot of fields that would appear in, in england in the, particularly in the places around avery and pusey vale um in the west country in somerset um there would um, be crop circles appearing and they weren't all circles, they were formations of different shapes. And, um, and of course, it, it ended up that some people were making them as well. But there's a difference. And so even though some people make them and copy them, so to, so to speak, um, they were appearing, that real ones were appearing. And the reason I know that is because I was in some sometimes that you couldn't, that you couldn't see any sign of a person making it. And also there was there was otherworldly kind of things happening. So, um, so there was one at Waden Hill and, um, and it's quite a hard hill to get up, takes a while. And it was a smallish circle, but we were there first, as soon as it appeared, I can't remember which year this was. And, um, and we could hear clicking. I, I feel like it's in the air. It's almost like electricity in the air. Like you'd hear this click, click, click. And um, it wasn't coming from the wheat, it was in the air. And then um, on the ground, so the ones that are made by people, we call fake ones. There's usually a hole in the middle where they put a stick and then they would have a rope and they would go around, make a circle and then put the stick somewhere else and make another one. And also they would go one way for the outline and then another way and fill it in. So there was these different things you see. Also when it's a person and if the wheat is green or some of it's green, you would see white lines where the piece of wood would go down and smash it and you see this white line go across um so all those things you know were not in this circle it was waves it was like um ocean almost um and uh, the clicking and i thought this is a real one and um and you feel really amazing and then some people came up there and i was with some friends and they were saying, where's the big circle? There's a bigger circle. And, and they were, were saying, but this one's real. We really think this one's real. <laughs> and they wanted to see a bigger circle. It was funny. But then right after that, we went to another one. And I think it was the one that was the B, but it was um, something that was shaped like a shape like that. And it definitely wasn't real. There was a researcher in the field before, just as I came in, he said, no, it's not real. <laughs> so actually I turned around and went out and went to another one. Because you know, there's, I don't really need to find one that's not examine one that's not the real thing. But yeah, so in other words, I'm just trying to say there was a lot of real circles that have we don't know. You know, they may be made by the white balls of light. Um, there was one uh, ball of light in a photo I took of us, and it was of a circle that wasn't real, um, but it was as if this light being was there looking at what we were doing. And um, another time, someone, uh, one of my friends. Uh, got a picture or, or a video of the ball, a little ball of light going around a circle. And it wasn't making it, it had been made already. But um, it's amazing. I have the video. Um, and that wasn't widely published, but then other people have also had 
have videos of balls of light making circles, and some of them are real. There's also one with a helicopter where the wall of light, it's kind of chasing the wall of light. So that's another really interesting thing. So those things were going on along with people making them as well. So it's amazing to, um, to be out there at that time, but we just don't see it. I just came back from England and I heard there was one, uh, but I, you know, had appeared, but I didn't really go and check it out because I just like to kind of go to some of the sacred sites, do some meditation, but most of the time, you know, explore other things there at the moment. Because you can't be in those days before you knew that if you went to a B&B in Avery and you were there in July or August, you just knew there was going to be a crop circle or two or more, you know, you just knew that. Um, and then um, so you're saying, oh, yeah, uh, Puerto Rico. I love it. We're, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I like to uh, really. Where are the um, crop explore. circles in Puerto Rico? I mean, oh, I'm, not crop I'm circles. Like no. Not ah. crop circles, but UFOs. You said UFOs Happy. and crop circles. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going, yeah, because you were saying, I'm sorry to change the subject. That's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, because you were saying crop circles and UFOs and what, you know, what's the latest. Um, so um, it, in, I like to really research the, uh, uh, Puerto Rico because <laughs> that is um, just amazing for people, you know, who have seen or experienced UFOs. Um, and fishermen particularly. And our friend there who is sort of the main researcher is Jorge Martin and his wife Marlene. And they have, um, you know, a, a book and so on. I mean, a book, yeah, books they have, but they also have magazine. Um, and they interview people still these days. And um, the, the thing is that from long time ago, even in the forties, the, the um, people who were exploring the caves, they were just that geologists they would see the little gray beings or the little green beings, different kinds of beings that lived in the forest. And, um, and one man actually said um, that he, he was guarding the camp when the, uh, the others went to explore the caves. And there was little beings that would come and look at him from the, you know, and just stare and were interested in him. And they, they looked a little like the grays, but a little bit more like maybe, maybe kind of greenish, some of them are described. And people go to El Yonke and they see beings by the waterfall, the Elmina waterfall. Um, and then also lots and lots of UFOs um, have been seen there. And um, sometimes jets have been chasing them. And there's um, a military, um, you know, US military are there. And I think part of it is because the ETs are there, um, because there seems to be bases underneath and um, a particularly one that we would go, not the base, but we would go to the Lake Laguna Cartagena and um, way back in 78, there was a whole lot of things happened there um, where the, um, I think it was 78, 79, um, that uh, there were light, there was smoke coming out from inside, like kind of blue smoke. They would always see UFOs gonna go in and out the lake, but it was as if the base was being expanded. It was if it's like it, it must have been made larger because it was like a, earthquakes would go on and things like that. And then people started seeing the little gray beings walking around and they would walk around, you know, at night or something um, because they seemed to be exploring and learning about the place. Maybe they just arrived and uh, the people who in the village nearby didn't mind at all. They, <laughs> they didn't mind. They were a little bit scared at times, but um, yeah, but then of course the military had to try to keep it secret. So they were, uh, you know, uh, cordoning off the area. But yeah, things like that happened. But we always like to go and like to see who has maybe had an experience lately. And you can usually find someone and Jorge helps us. And we go with him uh, to interview some witnesses. It's really fun. So we want to go next year because of COVID, we haven't gone for a while. And also before that, we were doing other things. But uh, yeah, we want to go again and, and uh, see what's going on there. How about you? Have you had an experience yourself? I mean, outside of your dreams, but yeah, you have. Um, no, I've seen UFOs. Um, I I don't know of actually. I might have met an ET who looked human. I don't know, um, but um, I, I've seen I've seen UFOs quite a few times. Um, and one time, um, it was really interesting because I but I didn't have a camera or anything at the time, and. Um, I was, when the, my children were small, 
um, I was, it, this would have been nine in the nineties, early nineties. Um, so uh, I was in the kitchen and, and I lived in Culver City then, California. And I was um, doing some work in the kitchen and it came over me that I should go and lay on the ground to help feel, you know, peaceful and feel the energy because I was kind of tired and stressed. So I'll oh, just go and lay on Mother Earth. So I went in the garden and I laid down and, I, and it was in the afternoon and I was noticing that there was three clouds that looked like angels. And that's all the clouds that were in the sky. And I was amazed because it was like someone had made it, done it on purpose because one was like this. And then there was one as if they had a trumpet, you know, the typical angel look, but they all had a different angel pose. I thought, this is incredible. How could the three clouds be doing that? And, uh, and then I noticed three stars, but they weren't stars um, because there's no stars. It was like two o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. And it was a hot day in June. And so they weren't stars at all. Um, and they would disappear and then appear somewhere else. So you didn't actually see it go. You saw that star disappear and then there it was. And then the other one disappeared and there it was. And my feeling was these UFOs have created these clouds that look like angels to catch my eye or maybe other people. It's not like it's just for me. Mm. It's they're doing something here, um, maybe. And they know people like angels and they feel positive when they see angels. Maybe someone's died and they want to look at them to look in the sky and see this. I, I don't know, but it was amazing. And, and they stayed there. Those three, start, the clouds gradually dissipated, the three, um, UFOs were in different places. They would be up there for a while. And my son brought out his telescope. It didn't work. It was like a, you know, small children's telescope. Couldn't see much. And, um, and it's almost like we got tired of it and we came in. That's <laughs> because even though, and if they were, and they, they couldn't have been stars, but even if they were, they would have moved gradually, you know, with the sky. But they stayed there right until it started to get dark, but then we didn't see them anymore. But that's, Have you ever that lost was, uh, time? Have you ever had missing time? Um, not that I know of. No, not that I know of. Um, uh, that's, that's another interesting thing. But we, I was going to Santa Cruz Island once and I saw a UFO much bigger than that, um, much more close. And it was right over the island and it was so dead still. You know, a lot of people talk about how when they see a, a UFO in the sky, especially if it's kind of low, it's almost like, is that on a pole? Is that really standing that still? Because we know that a helicopter couldn't do that. You know, you'd see it move a little bit, right? You know, but this is not vibrating or anything, just dead still over the highest point of the island. And I was asking people on the boat, well, is there some kind of pole there, something with something on it? No, you know? And then, so I kept watching that. And it was interesting because before I saw that, I was trying to tune into the ocean and the beings in the ocean because I began to get seasick. So I thought if I just sit still and I tune into the ocean and be at you know meditative state, maybe I won't get sick. And that's when I saw the UFO. Um, and then the boat moved so you couldn't see the island for a very short time like that. And when it moved back, it had gone. So it it, you know, if it was a helicopter, it would have taken a while to go, to move away, because there was nothing blocking the view. So that was the UFO over Santa Cruz, which mm. is an interesting place because there aren't, that's the island, not the place in California, but the island um, of Santa Cruz. Um, and so there's nothing there. And, um, uh, and so that's really an interesting thing, maybe one little house, but it's a great place to go for meditation and camping and stuff. Um, and then the other time I saw a UFO was in Hemet. So um, I was on a, um, I think it was a freeway. Someone else was driving. We were going to Idlewild, I think, um, or coming back. I can't remember. But I saw a much more close up UFO in daytime, but it was behind a building. And I thought it was a building. Again, I thought it was, <laughs> it was supposed to be there because I could see little windows and, and the whole shape of you, that you think a UFO should be. And I thought, oh, that's a weird building, um, but then nothing under it. And, and I said, you see UFO, you know, we were looking. And then the car, you know, of course moved and we were looking back and we couldn't see anything in that spot. So, and that was very quick, you know, you just see it and then it's gone. But mm -hmm. that's an ability that 
that they have on other planets. And that's something, you know, in the Vedas that's described, the siddhis or yogic abilities that, that are possible. So we think, you know, sometimes people think, oh, the Vedas is a lot of legends and made up stories, you know, because it can't really be like that, that like invisible, something can go invisible. Um, but that is, it's called antadana. And it's a city or ability that a person in a high, you know, a higher planetary system might have the ability to make themselves invisible and then go somewhere else. And then also they can make their craft invisible. Mm -hmm. So it's an actual thing that exists as an ability, just like we have abilities, but we don't have that. Um, rather than something magic or made up, you know. Right. So Absolutely. that's what I think was going on there. <laughs> May I ask you, does Vedic astrology say anything about UFOs and contact and disclosure going forward? Um, oh, not really. As a, Yeah, that, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, not exactly as a prediction or anything, because really they've always been here, you know, and so the, the Vedas really talk about the other beings from other planets as always being in the older days in the, in the better, you know, much better yugas or periods like the Dwarapara Yuga, for instance, was the last one um, before Kali, which is this one, you hear um, in Dwarapara Yuga a lot about the ETs coming to, to visit humans and, and giving them sometimes most of the um, Vimana or spaceships were given to people on this planet rather than these people on the planet making them. They were given by um, at what what people think of as a demigod or a deva, but it's like you know a higher a being who lives on a higher planet, and um, or they manifested them really advanced people um, like the sage Kadama Muni. He just imagined how he would like to take his wife for a trip around the universe. He could do it in his mind. He could visit other planets in his mind, but his wife couldn't. And he was thinking. It would be so nice for her to travel comfortably in a certain vimana. And he just imagined what it would be like. And he opened his eyes and there was the vimana right there. And he manifested it. Even though he didn't have material desires to show off about it, he just did it from love for love for his wife. And it was, you know, beautiful, huge vimana that he, he manifested that was attracted to come to him through his mind. Um, but otherwise, you know, other than that, um, demigods or, or, or devas or um, advanced beings had given um, different people on the planet, powerful people or spiritual people, um, certain kinds of vimanas. Um, and, um, and then also, um, you know, they were described mostly as being human looking, the different kinds of ETs. Um, and some very, very beautiful, like the Gandharvas. You, you hear the Gandharvas, they're kind of like angels because they were really good at music and singing. And you don't know, see all these advanced beings now because people are not that advanced here. And it's like um, the vibration from this planet isn't very positive, obviously. So that wouldn't be attracting these advanced beings who are very, um, you know, more spiritual and peaceful. Um, but they yeah, would appear just, you know, as an aside, it said that that advanced beings who come here are just mystified at the way we treat one another. Yes. They would never even, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of a word because in, in all their consciousness awareness, which may not mm -hmm. describe how they function, but you understand the vibration that they look at what earth beings do to one another, what humanity does <clears throat> in the name of love to hurt one another, in the name of countries and, yeah. and I am and you're not. And they look at the insanity here and they can't fathom it. They just think we're, we're like, yeah. you know, ants. How can they deal with us? Exactly. It's a frequency that's put out, you know, that they can feel the frequency. That's really how astrology works. It's the frequency of the planets, not the not the um, gravity, it's the frequency. Mm. So our frequency is pretty low. Um, and why would they come? Yeah, so that's why you hear a lot more of them being around in, in the ancient times in, in the Dwarpar Yuga than you do now. Um, but the greys were described too, and there's even pictures of them in the caves and um, uh, that look like greys. And so they're very ancient times. Um, and they were given the name, um, well, I didn't know if it was a gray or not, but there's a certain kind of ET they, they described as Kim Purusha, Kim Purusha, which means, is it human? So it's like oh. someone looked at it and said, 
is that human? <laughs> mm. And then it became called that. Um, so yeah, that could be a brain, but we think of them really as being on a more of us um, astral, like level, lower astral level than some of these great um, advanced ETs. There's so many different kinds. And we're actually kind of in between here. We're in the, the planets that are called the Buloka. Um, so they're kind of above us is the spa locus, the very advanced Bububa spa, Buva and then spa, the heavenly planets. And then of course below, not literally, but the less advanced would be a lot of more of, of uh, the lower astral, more difficult planets. Hmm. And um, we could be in either of them according to our desires and karma. <laughs> we could be in different ones according to our progress. Yeah. But yeah, yeah so. I, I, and I know about, you know, this ancient history and the inception and the planet and all, all of these. And I appreciate you going over this actually from a, the Vedic point of view is very interesting. And I was curious about how Vedic astrology might impact what's coming because you and I are in the same world <laughs> and we keep hearing perhaps in our lifetime they're going to disclose themselves that we yeah. may get to experience them. And I wasn't sure if the stars or astronomy are showing that that is in, indeed a fact in our lifetime. You and I will see this or maybe sometime in the future. Well, I, yeah, I think we will gradually see it. The, another thing about this age, though, is we're in a, um, a, a period uh, called Sandhya, and it's the very beginning of, of a yuga. So we're still at the beginning of Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. And in, within that time, there's meant to be a 10,000 year period when we make more progress on the spiritual level. And it's hard to see, but, <laughs> but more people are interested in, you know, um, the spiritual progress in life. And there's more things available. But um, I know it's really hard to see, but, you know, it's, it's called like a mini golden age when people will become more aware and people are getting born here in order to be have their last lifetime and not have to stay for the whole Kali Yuga, but to make their progress on the spiritual level. Um, so yeah, it's called the Sandhya period. So we are in that. So that's, that's also hopeful. Um, yeah, I do, it, it, even though it's not written as such in the Vedas about the, them disclosing themselves, in a way it's kind of said, you know, they're always here and they, they are disclosing themselves to certain people. And, um, and I think a lot of progress can be made, you know, coming up in the next few years. I see it more as a gradual thing because really it's already happened in a gradual way. Now they're talked about seriously in the government and even in the news. Um, so I think there's, you know, we're trying to help with that at the Conscious Life Expo and talk about it in that way every, every time we do conferences. Um, you know, I have the experts there and discuss these things. I think more people are aware and having experiences too. Serena, this is Dare to Dream. We're at the end of the show. What are you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm really working hard on the next Conscious Life um, Expo in February. And uh, for everyone, please go to ConsciousLifeExpo.com because we actually have a lot of the speakers already there, the pictures that you scroll down, um, and there's more to come. And there's a lot more events um, that we're having where you meet speakers and you meet each other. We're trying to have something every day where you can interact with each other because since co you know COVID and all that, we couldn't, we were scared to meet <laughs> anyone and a lot of people didn't come and it was hard for all conferences, of course. But, um, but now we want everyone to meet and have fun. So we're planning on more things like that. So that's what's a lot of things in my head like that. Um, and I will also, um, can, like I said, we're going to go to Puerto Rico again, personally. Um, and I work on a lot of things to help people. Another thing that I work on besides Love Button is, uh, the, um, is helping refugees. And so in, in your everyone's area, you can probably find some way of helping them. Um, because, you know, we look at, like I said, anyone could be us. Um, you could be, you, we could have been refugees in a past life and someone helped us and we probably were, you know, and, um, and so we don't want to be again either. Um, but yeah, I like to, to make friends with, with refugees from all different countries and, and uh, let them know they're welcome and do what I can. Um, so that's another thing that I continue to do. Thank um, you. And Thank you for your good work. <laughs> I mean, that's outstanding to give back at that level. 
And, um, and thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm very grateful. Oh, thank you. It's great to be with you. Really uplifting to be on your show too. <laughs> Serena Wright Taylor, and you can find more about her at her website, vimana.org. And I end today's show with this quote. The Vedas say that a person's karma is directly related to the position of the planet and stars, and thus, astrology is the method of understanding one's karma by analyzing these positions. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast to hear this weekly number one transformation conversation. Next week on the show, Amy Robeson is here. She's a master Akashic Records teacher, crystal expert and spiritual healer. If you folks are loving the podcast and you'd like to see what we look like, please go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and you can enjoy us there, see us animated and live. And finally, again, if you'd like a gift, invisibility so you can be more pronounced out in the world so that your brilliance is seen and heard, go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash gift and download your free gift on visibility from me today. Thank you so much for being with us.